Okay, Pashas Noyach, page 30. Okay, um, Pasik Tazayin, Pasik 16. Okay, the Pasik is saying basically, earth came, became destroyed. The ultimate corruption was stealing, meaning between man to man, rather between man and God. That was the worst sin. Hashem had enough. He said, that's it. I'm finished. I'm done with the world. Um, you should make a, a teva, an ark, right? And he told him how to make it. Wood type of wood, gopher wood. He said, you should pitch it inside and outside <clears throat> with tar to withhold the water. And the last thing we learned is he told him how the, the dimensions <clears throat> of the teva. 300 amis, which again, feet, 450 feet long. 50 amas wide, 75 feet wide, 30 amas to height, 45 feet high. Three stories, well, he's going to say in a second. The ark had three stories. Okay, that was the dimensions. Like we said, basically a double football field, as far as that goes. Okay, so I'm passing to Zion. Tsayar Tasa Teva, you should make a light. But we'll soon see what this light was. Now, you have to understand. We'll learn later. The Medrash says, during the year of the... Okay, just let me explain one thing. The flood rained 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? But the flood lasted a year. After the 40 days of rain, 40 days and 40 nights, the water was still all over the place. So Noah and gang and company... And all the animals that were there were in the ark for a complete year. Mm-hmm. That year, the Medrash says, the, the systems didn't work. The sun didn't come out. The moon didn't come out. It was like Shimsha <clears throat> All the constellations, nothing worked. It was like a dead world. Okay? But it took a year's time for, for Neuch to be in the table. Now, obviously, if it's dark outside... He needs some type of a light system in the ark. I mean, you need to see what we're doing. Okay? So Hashem says to him, Tsayar Tasa Here it says, in this English it says, make a window. Uh, another interpretation is make a light. So there's actually two interpretations what the word Sohar means. Sohar, by the way, in Hebrew means Tsoharayim, which means the afternoon when the sun is shining. So Tzohar, by definition, means shining. But you have, either it means a window, and then the commentaries ask, like, what did the window do if there was no light outside? What did the window do anyway? And we'll see about that later. Another interpretation, Noyach hung up a very bright, shiny stone, uh, gem. And that gem, some miraculously, obviously, because it has no light to reflect, it's not going to shine anything. But miraculously, it was like a, a, an expensive rock, a gem, not a stone. I don't know how many carats it was. But it was Tzaya uh, Tassel Latev. In fact, Rashi quotes both things. Rashi says, some people say it was a window. Some people say it from the Medrash. Some people say it was a shining stone that lit up dark. Okay. Well, Now, again, the, the Amma was fi- the, the Teva was 50 Amis wide. Now, you can't have a box because then the rain wouldn't run off. Right? So the Pasik is saying here now, when they made the Teva, the Teva and the upper level went up like this. That it should be slanty uh, walls that the water should run off the ark. If not, it's going to get be stuck on the, on the ark. And on top, the total width on top was one amma, which is a foot and a half. That means the whole width was 50 amma, 75 feet. On top, it ended up being al-amma, t'chalana, mamayla. It was only one amma or a foot and a half. U-pesach ha-tseva, teva, tosim. And the entrance of the ark should be put on the side. Obviously, if it's on top, the rain's going to hit it. So Hashem told him to make the door. And the, the Mephoshim is an interesting thing. Where was 
the door. Which part, which floor was the door? So the Mephoshim explain, Kedib says, it was on the top third of the ark. The door wasn't like you see in the pictures that the kids have, that, you know, at the bottom floor there was a door and that that's where they went in. No. It said they all had to climb ladders. They didn't have escalators or elevators in those days. They had to climb ladders and the door was on the upper third, meaning on the top floor of the, of the ark was where the door to get in and out of the table was. Tachtiyim, shniyim, ushlishim tarsel. And you should make a bottom floor, second floor, and third floor. Okay? The upper floor, what was the purpose of the three floors? The upper floor was for Neach and family. The second floor was for all the animals. And the bottom floor <coughs> was for all the garbage. They had no garbage pickup in those days, especially during the flood. So, in fact, the, the Mephoshim asked an interesting thing. Why in the world, Neach and family, Neach and Mrs. Neach, uh, three kids and wives, right? Nobody had kids yet. So there are six people. Why do six people not need such a big apartment? Okay? So the Mephoshim answer, number one, interestingly, all the birds that were in the ark were on the upper floor. All the provisions of food for the year was on the upper floor. So it wasn't only Noyach and family on the upper floor, it was actually birds and all the provisions that they needed food. What? Oh, I thought I want to say something. Where was the bathrooms? Um, the bad basement, probably. Well, I mean, I don't know what the animals did, but um, they worked in the ark. I mean, it was a zookeeper. Why, why, why were the birds on top? Because the animals? Well, they're not really animals, but... Um, the Mephoshim say that... The, no, not because they were easier to, to fly around. They just they didn't need to be a cage. They just let them fly around on the upper floor. The kosher birds that were brought in. So was it going in any direction or was it was just as the river moved? As this we learned last week, the ark moved based on the water. There was no motor, no oars, no nothing. It was a box floating wherever the water took it. Huh? It was not in a, you know, heavy speed. No, it wasn't going anywhere. There was no motor. It was a box floating in the water. Now, put a box in the ocean, it goes wherever the ocean takes it, that's all. Here it was rain, it was much stronger force, but yeah, no, no, it went wherever it was led. Okay, so now it says like this. Vani, Hashem says, as for me, literally means I, but it means for me. Okay? Hashem said like this. You built the ark. Now what's my, what am I doing? I'm destroying the world. Now I'm just, he's telling Noach, now that you built the ark, he said, now I'm going to bring the, the water. He gave the people 120 years to, uh, to repent, and they didn't. And we'll soon learn, he gave them another week. After the 120 years, God held up the flood a week because Mr. Shalach died. And Hashem waited until the mourning period for the tzaddik Mr. Shalach, who lived the longest of any person, uh, would be finished. And then out of respect to Mr. Shalach, Hashem waited another week until he actually brought the flood. So he says like this, I'm about to, in Mayville, I'm going to bring the flood, okay, of, of the water on the earth, to destroy all flesh, that is a living thing, every, any living creature. And the commentaries, the Medrash says from this, that means even the devils and the demons and the shadim and the angel, everything that was alive. You know, years ago there were devils and demons, they're, now they're banned from the earth. So the time in the Gemara's time there were de- shadim and devils and demons and all that stuff. There was there was a real reality. But that's not physical. 
they that's what I'm saying, but they were still spiritual beings with a refined body like an angel. A shade, not a curtain, shindalit as it's called, a demon, was able to take on any human form. They're able to look like anybody except their feet were webbed. They weren't physical, but when they became a physical entity, they were able to become physical entities. They became, they could, there's a famous story with Shlomo Melech, okay, the, the Shadim threw him out of Yerushalayim all the way out, and Ashmedai, the chief, the demon took over, and he looked exactly like Shlomo Melech, and Shlomo Melech comes back to the castle, and he said, I'm Shlomo Melech, they said to him, who are you? Get lost. We did Shlomo Melech on the throne. So he told them, Shlomo Melech told him a way to figure out to get his feet, because he never uncovered his feet, Ashmedai, because that would look webbed like a duck. So Shlomo Melech told him a way to get Ashmedai's feet uncovered, and then they saw that it was really Ashmedai and not Shlomo Melech. The whole story, they're able to take on physical forms, except their feet were always wet. But they were, the Madras says they were also brought into the Teva. Now, let's discuss for a minute. <laughs> Who? <laughs> yeah, the Shadim also went into the Teva. <laughs> what floor were they on? I don't know. It doesn't say. Shadim or? Shadim. <laughs> why, why would they say, say the Shadim? They, uh, it says here in the passage, look what it says. Call a call basan ashabaydu achaim any living thing. Any living thing, it, the major says means any living thing. Now the word mabul at the beginning of the pasuk the Torah says any maybe some mabul mayim. Now everybody knows mabul means a flood, but how in Hebrew does the word mabul come to the word flood? So the Mephoshim explain, the root of the word is really novel. The root of novel is novel, which means destruction. Another means, um, the word novel means falling, is also related to belula. Belula means mixed. In Hebrew, belula means to be mixed. Therefore, anything that falls from heaven, like snow, it could, it could be called a flood of water. Now, it says an interesting thing. Um, it says like this. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, when Noach rebuked the people, he told them, you know, God's going to bring a flood, you're going to be destroyed. So they started laughing at him. They said, a flood of what? A flood of fire? We can combat it. A flood of water? We can handle They had no idea what the power of this flood was. Okay? So therefore, he said... Maybe he'll bring a mabul, not of mayim, but maybe a mabul of ash. Mabul means a mixture, a mix-up. And therefore, it also comes to the word, mabul comes to the word bila. <laughs> bila, which means destroyed. And bavel, <clears throat> by the way, bavel, it says, kisham balal Hashem has kol ha'aretz. Hashem mixed up, earlier we learned about bavel, Hashem mixed, I'm sorry, the end of Neich. Hashem mixed up the whole world when the, they the, made the tower Bavel. So Bavel actually means mixed up, and that's the root of the word Mabel, Bavel. And therefore they bring down, it says, uh, Uncle says, everything from the flood ended up in Bavel, which is very below sea level. So when everything in the world gets destroyed, where did everything end up? In Bavel. But let's go back. I have a question. Yeah. You said that God destroyed. Uh, that's why Noah had to make the dark. The ark. So, but at the same time, you're saying that the devil was inside the ark. Why didn't he destroy the, that? You said the shaitan, the shaitan. Shaitan are not bad. They are not bad. <coughs> no, they're not. But the not okay. There's no concept of devil as the Christians have in Judaism. The bad inclination. There is, in other religions, there is God and there's the devil, two entities. Correct? Yeah? It doesn't exist in Judaism. 
Everything was made by Hashem. In fact, they tell a story that in a religious school, uh, not non Jewish religious school, they were learning Bible studies. So the teacher is telling the kid in, in Bible study that God made the world. So the kid gets up in school and says, That's not true. God made the heaven and earth, everything else was made in China. <laughs> only God didn't make everything. Only, okay. Hashem made good, Hashem made evil. Evil is not evil. Evil is good. Why is evil good? This is a chsidus, Yutus Kislev. Why is evil good? Because in order for good to be good, you need the ability to do evil. If you can't do good, if you can't do bad, then good is no good. And why are you waiting for the Mashiach? Because that's the revelation of the ultimate good. Why are you, we, not you, we, waiting for Mashiach? Yeah, what, huh? We. We're waiting for Mashiach because that's the revelation of the ultimate good when evil will be destroyed from the earth. Ruach HaTumah Avim and earth, there will not be any more evil in the earth because all the evil was refined through the work of exile and Jews doing Torah mitzvahs and the Goyim doing their seven mitzvahs, you know, the seven Noahid laws. That is eventually the revelation of Mashiach. In other words, in order for good to be good, you need the opportunity to, to, to do bad. Correct? So therefore, when God created good, good is an end by itself. It's a tachlis by itself. God created evil not as an end by itself, not as a purpose by itself. Hashem created evil as a means for good to be good. That means the only intent of evil is not evil. The intent of evil is for good to be good. Because in order for good to be good, you have to be able to do evil. If you can't do bad, and you can only do good, then good is not good. Right? The definition ultimately of good is when I have a choice to do good or bad, and I choose to do good over bad. So therefore, in order for me to be able to be good, I need an opportunity to be bad. So that's why Hashem created evil. But he didn't create, like the Christians say, there's good, God, and there's evil comes from the devil, and there's this constant fight between good and evil. It's not true. I'm not in our religion, at least. Hashem created everything. Everything is good. Some things are openly good, and some things are hidden good, because otherwise good cannot be good. But we are fighting within ourselves. Yeah, within ourselves. Good and bad. Correct. So that's why God gave us a Yetzirah, the evil inclination, that we should have, try to convince us to do bad, and we don't, and we do good. That's what it's all about. Okay, what did you want to ask? Just a little bit before about Hashem waiting a week more. Yeah. Is that where we learn that a person actually um, does takes a week off after a person no. leaves the world? And then we learn not from Meshur Ben, we learn not from Yaakov Avinu, not from the Mabu. This is not a person sitting... This is God just waited a week. <coughs> okay. So anything... Back to the passage. Anything... Underneath the heavens... Anything that's on the earth... Will expire... Die... Um, meaning... And it's interesting. It says... What does that exclude? The fish... We mentioned last week the fish. Where were the fish during the flood? Fish were in the water. The miracle was, even though the water was boiling hot water, boiling hot water, the fish miraculously stayed alive, like everything else in the flood was a miracle. But the God says, anything on dry land will perish. And the Madras says that from here it didn't apply to the fish at all. Okay, other people say, what does yigva mean? In the English is translated as expiring. But other Mephoshim learned yigva means a quick death. Now, even when God, you know, later on, when the Egyptians drowned in the sea, so it says some of them were thrown up and down, 
you know, so different uh, people. The, the righteous Egyptians sunk right away and died. The other ones were floating a little bit and died. Uh, and the bad, the real bad Egyptians were floating up and down. In other words, it was a torturous death. Here, the commentaries that Adak and Ezra say that the word yigva in Hebrew means perish, expire, but it means a quick expiring. That even when God punished the wicked people, he did it with a, uh, a rather uh, huh? merciful death. He made him die right away. Okay. Um, now, other people say, what does it mean, yigva? What, whatever is on the earth will expire, meaning even vegetation. Now, vegetation doesn't have a soul, so to speak. So therefore, they say yigva means will shrivel up. That's the death of vegetation when it shrivels up. So this is the, the various different explanations of the word vayigva. Okay, but Kimesi as Brisi now Shem says like this: I will establish my covenant with you. Okay, Uvasel um, Ateva, you should come to the ark. Atov and Nachov, Ishtachon Sheva Nach Itach. You, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. What covenant did God make? It says God makes a covenant with them. Okay, so some people say. My covenant that I'll make after the flood, that I will never bring another flood. But Rashi says the simple meaning of it is, just think of it. Food lasted in the ark for a year. No refrigeration. No new stuff. No new shipments. Okay? So God made a covenant with Noach that everything in the ark will remain and won't spoil. It's one covenant. Another covenant, meaning another one simply, the Ebenezer says, that Noach and his children will not die. That was the covenant that Hashem made with Noach, that you and your children are not going to die, you're going to be saved in the ark. Another probably thing could be that um, <coughs> um, the covenant, okay, some people want to say, we mentioned already in the past, what's the covenant? A covenant is, definition of any marriage is a covenant. Bris mila, circumcision is a covenant. Okay. The concept of a covenant is, if two friends are friends, and they're good friends, they really don't need a covenant when things are good. Right? When things are good, you don't need a covenant. You're friends. Everything's good. Why not? What's the purpose? Like a marriage covenant. Yeah? What's the concept of a marriage covenant? That when even when things are bad, you just won't split? You have a covenant that you're going to stay married to each other and you're going to work it out. That's what a covenant David and Yohanan made in, 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 in the Tanakh, Right? That even though, well, while they were good friends, they didn't need to make it. Why did they make it? In case, God forbid, something is going to come up, so they're going to be bound by the bond to be together. In the ark, remember we said one of the reasons why Noach later didn't want to go out of the ark until God told him to go out was because it was the era of Mashiach. Why was it the era of Mashiach? The Zayar says, the Arab Mashiach, the Navi says, the wolf and the lamb will live peacefully. Because they even Kevis, the wolf and the lamb are going to live peaceful. Yes? In the ark, all the animals of opposite fighting natures all live peacefully for a year. It's actually a miracle. It was such a miracle that Noyach said, as much as he was working and got kicked and bitten and, and coughing of blood, we'll learn later. Nech didn't want to leave the Teva. It was an era, like Mashiach's time, that all the animals live peacefully together. There is no fighting. Everybody gets along, which is the era of Mashiach, basically. Everything gets along. Good, bad, everybody gets along. So the covenant could also be that all the animals are going to get along together. There won't be any fighting. 
So when the animals came off the tape, have they got back to their regular natures? Um, could be. Even the humans went back to their think about animals today, right? Huh? Even the humans went back back to their bad nature, and God had to destroy them again. Well, he never destroyed the, mm, mankind. That was one city, two cities, <coughs> five cities max. When he davened for the five cities, but he never destroyed. God made a vow that he will never destroy the world again, and therefore he didn't. He destroyed the city, destroyed the Egyptians in the in the in the sea, but he never destroyed the world at large. I said many times. Yom Kippur, you know that day is some day called Yom Kippur. You know everybody's uh, serious. One second, serious a little bit, and they, okay, I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna get better, right? Isn't that what happens every Yom Kippur to everybody? Okay. How many people did you see drastically change after Yom Kippur from the day before Yom Kippur? Zero. <clears throat> Zero. You're realist. Yeah. Now, does that mean it was fake Yom Kippur? No. But if nobody changed, why wasn't Yom Kippur fake Yom Kippur? Because they're trying. They want to. But the evil inclination is okay. so strong. So the answer is, so the answer is, and Yom Kippur, like you're saying, Yom Kippur, everybody means it. But you know what? We got a Yetzirah. So the animals in the ark lived nice, peacefully with each other. They got out. I don't know what happened right away. You know, there's a lot of room in the world then. The whole new world. Clean, laundered, fresh. God hot washed the world. The whole world was clean. Yeah. So with the Noah, does that mean that the world came to an end at that time? You're saying? The 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 living world yeah, all living creatures died. Except the ones that were in the ark. Maybe millions. It was ten generations, and each one had a bunch of kids, and you know, I don't know how many. I don't think it says anywhere how many, but it was a lot. Each one gave birth to sons and daughters, and you know. Okay. Now he says like this. <clears throat> May I? Oh, one interesting thing over here the Torah says. If you look at the Pasik, the Torah says, who's going into the ark? You, your sons, your wife, and the wives of your kids. Separating the, the genders. It doesn't say you and your wife, your kids and their wives. It says you and your kids, your wife and their wives. Which means, as Rashi says in the Medrash, marital relations were forbidden in the ark. God said, separates it. You and your sons, your wife and their wives. Meaning, total mechitza. Total separation. They did not have marital relations that year. And one of the reasons simply is, the world is suffering while you're doing this. And also, God didn't want any kids born in the ark. Because they can't kind of question what country they belong to. No. Is that why there was peace in the Uh Probably. They didn't fight. Nayachan is. What's interesting, the Medrash says, Mrs. Nayach is, I mean, it mentioned before her name was Naama, you know, Chos Tovokai Naama, and Rashi said that was the wife of Nayach. But it says that Nayach's wife, Mrs. Nayach's actions were just as good as her husband's. So her behavior. Huh? What did it mean? She was a tzaddik, like he was. Is not a tzaddik? Uh, relatively, the Torah says he was a tzaddik. He had 120 years to build the Teva for a reason. Maybe to change one person. How come anybody, you don't need to be tzaddik, to bring somebody to make him a good person? How come Noah to not make it? Neach didn't try. That's why he wasn't a chabadnik. Neach was like, we learned last week, a tzaddik in a hot, warm fur coat. He kept the warmth all for himself. But the truth of the matter is, when did the responsibility of one person to the next begin? 
You always have to give. No. No, one second. According to Torah law, when does the obligation of me being responsible to make sure you do what's right, when did that begin? Oh, no. no. After Matan Tera, and some people say in the 40th year in the desert. After Matan Tera. After Matan Tera. Until then, there was no halachic obligation of the kind of call you saw Arevim, Zelo Zed, the responsible one for another. And therefore, if, if I have the ability to change you and I don't, so I get to sin because I'm not changing you. But even though it wasn't an obligation, Avram Avinu did do it. Avram Avinu did it. And therefore, Avram Avinu was much greater than Neach. But Neach was personally still a tzaddik. In his own personal life, he had no obligation, according to law, to go change anybody. And he himself did what he had to do. He didn't have to keep Torah. He didn't have to keep Shabbos. He didn't have to keep any mitzvahs because he wasn't Jewish. Noah kept the seven night laws. And he was a righteous man. But he didn't have an obligation to, to change anybody. When Avram became a Jew, I mean, what, how we say that? Why was Avram the first Jew and not Noah? Well, let me ask you a better question. Why wasn't Adam the first Jew? He was a pretty good guy, Adam. I mean, he listened to his wife, messed him up, but why wasn't Adam the first Jew? Why wasn't Neach the first Jew? Why wasn't Mr. Shalom the first Jew? Um, what, uh, what was unique about Avram was he be... came to the realization on his own. God revealed himself to Adam, God revealed himself to Neach, God revealed himself to Mr. Shalom, God revealed himself to the, the only one on his own and especially according to the Gemara, that he was three years old, that he recognized the existence of Hashem, he did it on his own. That's why he, be, he was considered the first Jew. Because he came to that realization on his own. Neuch was not a Jew. Neuch was soon going to learn, God told him some laws of Torah. God told him that, you know, two of the kosher, I mean, non-kosher animals, seven, seven of the kosher animals. How did Neuch know what's kosher, not kosher? So obviously Hashem taught him choosing card has split hooves it's kosher animals from there you're going to take 14, 7 and 7 and the non-kosher animals you're going to take 2 that's how he knew okay Mikol HaChai, Mikol Basar now the Torah is not going into the details the Torah is saying like this the minimal from all living <coughs> Mikol Basar from all flesh meaning all the living things Okay? Um, you should bring it to the ark to live with you. Uh, you should be male and female. Why? Because God wanted, again, the world to exist. So if you have two males and two females, they're not going to have any kids, the animals. Hashem wanted that the world should repopulate itself with people and animals and, and everything else in the world. So therefore, Hashem told him to take Zohar and the Kepha. Not only that, may I from me nail from the birds of their own kind, okay? Meaning, uh, each kind, because, again, we learned before, even the animals were corrupt. Why were the animals corrupt? He started mating other animals. Therefore, which animals came into the ark? Which animals? They all came to the ark, right? Which animals did the the expression of the medrash is that the teva culte say some? The teva accepted them. It was only animals that didn't sin. The same thing with the birds. So Hashem said to me, now from the birds according to each kind." The commentaries mean that they didn't sin with any other type. Um. Um, from all the animals to its own kind, which, by the way, behemoth generally we feel re- refers to dom- domesticated animals. There's behemoth in Hebrew. There's behemoth and chaya. Chaya are non-domesticated animals, like a deer, lions, those things. And the domesticated animal, like ox, cattle, uh, sheep, and that. That's called behemoth. Not in the ark. Not in the ark. No. Cham did. That's why he was cursed. But that was a different issue. 
about the creeping animals, like insects. Huh? Like also, he says, "Me called Emma saw All that creeps on the ground. But again, Lemineo, to its kind, they also didn't sin. In other words, the only ones that came into the table were the animals that didn't sin. The animals that sinned didn't come in. Yeah, it's also the dog, no? Yeah, some say it was a dog that made it all. Right? We'll see later when we get there. Uh, and, and the co- uh, and the... We'll get when we get there. We'll discuss about the dog and the the raven and the, the whole story. Yeah. Okay, and then it says like this: Yavayu and Lecha. And here's an interesting expression. The Torah says, they shall come to you. It doesn't say bring them. It says Yavayu, meaning, as we mentioned before, this is where the Medrash learns that all the good animals came themselves to the ark to go into the ark. That means Hashem made that the good animals, behaving animals, were the ones that came to the ark by themselves. And you should take for yourself from all food that you're going to eat. And those are all the, that you need appropriate food for various animals. Um, and here the Kayaka says an interesting thing, by the way. Nayach technically... If he was a Jew, that's why he wasn't a Jew. If he was a Jew, he would say, you know what? Everybody's dying anyway, so I might as well take all their possessions. I mean, right? It shouldn't go to waste. Hashem said to him, You have to take your, from your own possessions. Meaning like this. Hashem said all the food that you're going to take into the ark for yourself and the animals... Has to be yours. Why? Why did Hashem do? What does Hashem care if he took everybody else's food? Hashem wanted to make the miracle greater. How much food can I have already? Okay, I'll have enough for the family and some animal. You know how much food he needed for all the animals. You know, you ever go to a zoo? I mean, you see what they eat. He's talking about a year's time. So Hashem said, no, I want you to take the food that you have, and that food that you're going to take is going to be enough for all the animals, which is another miracle in itself. Not only it didn't rot, which is a miracle, but it was enough for everybody else. Also, uh, the wild animals didn't eat meat? Huh? The wild animals didn't eat meat? Like, the lion didn't eat meat? <laughs> I don't know what they ate, and he brought them food. Hashem said to him, by the way, and this is what it means, whatever you bring in will be enough for them to eat and they'll all eat it. <coughs> Hashem promised him, you, you think about it, how can he bring, you know, you know how much food you would need for a year? Maybe it was like mon, like mono. No, it wasn't mono, it was food that Noyer brought, but Hashem made like the amount of food last, it was a miracle, Okay. The amount of food lasted for all the animals for the whole duration of the year. I mean, there's unbelievable miracles here going on. Whatever God commanded him, Cain also that he did. Meaning it, meaning he did everything God told him to do from A to Z. How to build the ark, you know, 120 years it took him because he had to do it himself. The, the family, animals, the, the, the food, everything, he did it exactly the way Hashem told him to do it. He didn't get any help from animals or, the, or his sons or anything to build the, 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 the ark? So when do parents get ever get help from their sons? Well, think nobody helped them? Like nobody? No, Hashem told me you have to make it yourself. That's why it took him 120 years. The Rebbe explains, according to Rashi, why did it take him so long to build the Teva? And Rashi doesn't even seem to explain why. Like, why should it take 120 years to build the Teva? To try to change people around here. Yeah, but, that, but still the building of the Teva didn't have to take that long. No, but but the answer mean, is, no, Rashi says, because he had to do it himself. No helping in building the Teva. No help schlepping the wood 
no help holding the wood when he nailed it in, whatever he did. He had to do everything himself from A to Z. And it was a difficult task, and yet he did it. Okay. You wouldn't want to do it? What's the option? How many, how many years people lived in that time? How many what? How many years people lived in that time? 1,900. No, but, but before the flood, it went down. They're still living seven, 800 years. After the flood, it drastically changed to a few hundred years. But the people living, you know, earlier, eight, 900 years, 950, nine, uh, 100 years after the flood? No, I'm saying after the flood, it went down that people lived only a few hundred years. So when did it go to, like, what is now? After, afterwards. After Mujerabin, no? Mujerabin was time. Mujerabin lived 120 years, but mm -hmm. normally people didn't live that long. In that time. Right. So maybe it was... It seemed to be only maybe 10, 15 years. What? At the time that it took them to, to relative to the, his age. I mean, what do you mean? It didn't take him 120 years. It took him 120 years. Well, I mean, it's like as if it would be like 10 years, 15 years of someone living five years. Ten. You mean how long it felt? Right. I mean, yeah. Based on how, much, how long he lived. Yeah, let me, like let me like tell you a little, a little mathematical five, secret. Yeah. You ever know, as we become adults, time flies quicker than it did when we were kids? Mm -hmm. Remember that? You know that? Yeah. You're a young kid, but I'm saying us adults, yeah? Time flies much quicker now than it did when we were kids. Why? Because when you're kids and you're 15, every year is a 15th of your life. Proportionally, it's a longer percentage of your life. If you're 60... It's the 60th of your life, right? So it's going four times quicker than a 15-year-old. Understand? So proportionally, based on your lifespan, the older you get, the quicker the years go because it's the less proportion of your life. <clears throat> it's very simple math. So therefore, it feels quicker. It's not quicker. 120 years is 120 years. You might have not have felt that long, I mean, Bukhlal, let me ask you a different question. Between me and you off the record. What did people do in 900 years? I mean, again. They're appropriating. No. They didn't each have a thousand kids. I mean, come on. Just think, what did they do a whole day? There were no phones. There were no television. There was no internet. There was no, even 300 years ago, what did... They used to sit on the porch. What, what did people do before televisions came out? You guys don't know. Okay, you're a bunch of babies. The people would sit on the porch and talk and talk to the neighbors and then do this and then, you know. Huh? Eight apples, yeah, whatever. years were sleeping. If it's like, you know, the one third of the 300 years was sleeping. Okay, I don't know, but. So what were they doing? What were they doing in those times? I guess they worked on the fields. They walked a few hours. They walked a few hours a day. I don't know what they did. Just think about it, but stop to think about it. What did they do all day? 900 years. You know what 900 years is? Come on. If a person lives to 90, which is, you know, relatively speaking, a long life, this is 10 times that. Hmm. But you have to remember one thing. There was no aging in those days. The first one to age was Avram Avinu. When it says Avram Zaking, and the Gemara says, until Avram Avinu, Ad Avram Zikna. Nobody aged. That means when they were 900 years old, they were like youngsters. I mean, not babies, like full grown people. They didn't age. Okay. Huh? Okay. Because why would they age? Avram Avinu davened for aging. Why? Because Avram and Yitzchak looked identical. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew which one was the father and which one was the son. So Avram Avinu said to Hashem, make me look older, that the, I shouldn't, the people should know I'm the father and he's the kid. And the Until Yaakov Avinu, nobody ever got sick. 
In Pashas Vayichi, it says, V'hine avich l'chayla. So the Gemara says, Ad Avram, Ad Yaakov, lo hayo chula. Chula. There was no illness in the world. When a guy, no such thing as sick in the world. Okay? No doctors in those world. All the doctors didn't exist. When a person's time came to go, they sneezed. The Shema went out of the nose. The way it went in, it says, God blew into his nose. Hashem blew into his nostrils in the Shema of life. Okay? So the, the, the Gemara says, the Madras says, when it came, came time for people to go, how did they go? They weren't sick. No hospitals. No Medicare. No Medicaid. No Obamacare. So how did they die? Then the sh- they sneezed. Why, why wouldn't people sneeze? You say, Gesundheit, Tzugazun, bless you. Why? When somebody coughs, you don't tell Tzugazun. I mean, why? Because back then, people died when they sneezed. So when somebody sneezed, you say, bless you, because that's the way people used to die. One second. Yaakov Aminu came along and he said to God, listen, I want to know before I die. Why? He wanted to bless his children, right? The whole story, you know, he wanted to bless his children. So Yaakov Inu said to God, Tashem, do me a favor, tell me before I die. I want to know that I'm going to die. So Hashem gave him a warning sign. He made him sick. So he knew he was dying. And then he blessed his children. But until Yaakov Avinu, that means you have to realize the first 23 generations of the world, and you know how long those generations were. Yeah, it was over 2,000 years. Yeah, over 2,000 years, nobody was ever sick. After Yaakov Avinu. But there's you ask for a sign. But look at You see what happens when you ask for something? But he, he, he asked for himself, not for <laughs> Listen, Hashem needs to give everybody to make a living. Right? Not everybody can work in the land anymore. So Hashem made doctors and medicines and pharmacists and lawyers and, uh, lawyers and uh, this and listen, God does what makes everybody happy. Can you imagine if there'd be no doctors, no lawyers, no... Uh, what would people do for a living? Uh, but like what? Be jewelers, uh, do me a favor. housemakers, and uh, contractors. And, yeah, especially with the permits. Without any sickness. Okay. What? You know what I was thinking, Rabbi, that maybe people did live so long, like 900 years, because less things happened in the world... Like, if we lived for 900 years, there would be so many changes. Like, maybe a person couldn't handle all. Like, even hear about people who live, like, to, like, 100. Like, they went through so many things in their life. You know, like, all the wars that happened in the world and all that stuff. Yeah, but (laughs) you have today, for instance, there's more Alzheimer's today than there was years ago. You know why? Because people didn't live that long. Right? 50, 60 people passed away. When, nobody gets Alzheimer's. It's Rarely do you get Alzheimer's at 60, right? You get it much later on in life. So people didn't live that long, so Alzheimer's didn't exist. Even cancer and a lot of these things that older people you know, usually end up getting is because they're living longer. If they live shorter, these illnesses wouldn't be. So what does that mean? What does that mean as far as what? <laughs> what does that mean, like... That it's living long brings other things with it? it? The fact is it does. Medical science today says that because people are living longer, mm-hmm. there are more illnesses in the world mm-hmm. that, didn't, that weren't dominating so much in the earlier years because people died much long, shorter. But in, when the first few th- 2,000 years when people lived long, mm-hmm. there were no illness. So then the whole issue didn't exist. So what is the, the you know, according to Allah, according to Allah, it's forbidden for a Jew to live in a city where there's no doctor. It's forbidden to live in a city, the Gemara says, and Shekhanar says, where there's no doctor. Why? Why? Because naturally a person gets sick. Correct? And therefore, if there's no doctor in the city then you're relying on a miracle. But if, I, I told you the story when the previous Rebbe came over on the ship 
from Europe, he got very sick on the ship. Okay, when he came over, Tesla, the 1940, he, he, he got very sick on the ship. And there was a Jewish doctor, a good doctor on board, that cured him. Okay, listen to this. Afterwards, the doctor asked the previous Rebbe forgiveness. And the Rebbe said to him, why are you asking forgiveness? You cured me, you saved my life. And he said, listen to this, uh, uh, a feeling of a Jewish guy. He said, if I wouldn't have been on board, you wouldn't have gotten sick because there wouldn't have been anybody to take care of you. So because I was on board, that's why Hashem allowed you to get sick because then I can take care of you. But if I wouldn't, the, the doctor wouldn't have been on board, Hashem wouldn't have made you sick. So he says to the Rebbe, because of me, you got sick. I mean, it's interesting, hergish, like they say, an interesting feeling. So then why did people only live for 900 years then? Only? Yeah. There's a guy, Adam, that sinned, and Hashem said people will not live forever. That's why, only because of that. So like in those days when a person like lived for 900 and someone else only lived for like 600 or whatever, they would be like... Nobody in those days lived 600. Most of them lived 900, between 800, high eights and low nines. You mean you were they jealous that this guy lived longer than him? Man, if they're jealous at that stage of the game, let them be jealous. Okay, let's start this passing. Okay, the next parak. Hashem said to Neach, Bay Ata Vachobesh Chalateva. Okay, you now Hashem is commanding him to come into the ark. And it's interesting. Normally, the Torah always used the word Elohim. Vayom Elohim l'Noach. All over Hashem is telling Noach Vayar Elohim, Vayom Elohim. The whole time it's saying Elohim. When Hashem tells him to come into the ark, the pasuk says Vayom Hashem. Not Elohim. Huh? Yud Kevavke. Why? Because now Hashem is telling him the attribute of mercy that I'm saving you. Until now, God was speaking about destruction. I'm going to destroy the world. That's Elohim, which is the attribute of judgment, of severity. But when it comes to saving Noyach, Hashem says that... Um, Elokim, not Elokim, because this is the attribute of jo- of kindness. Okay? The name is mercy, and that's why Hashem is saving to him. And he says like this, I want you and your family to come into the ark. Because you, okay, I've seen as a tzaddik in this generation. Okay? Now, the Mephoshim say, the Tzipurim says, what is Hashem excluding over here? Hashem said, you were a tzaddik. Who's he excluding? Noyach's family. Except Mrs. Noyach. Even the kids weren't that great. It's only because of you they're saved. Hashem was good. Hashem was good. Who was good? Shame. Shame was good, but the other people weren't. And the wives probably weren't good either. Because they, you know, it doesn't say anything about them. Mm-hmm. It doesn't say anything about... It's, the Torah says who Mrs. Noach was. Nama. Okay? But the Torah doesn't say anything about Noach's wives. Nothing. Not good, not bad. Nothing. They were all saved in the merit of Noach. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason why they survived. So Hashem says, Hashem says, I am doing mercy now, and therefore, personal mercy to you that you're going to be alive, and because of that, your household. And another interesting thing, the Malbum says, V'cho Beischa doesn't only mean your family, it means your possessions too. V'cho means everything in your house. 
the pictures, the whatever. Hashem said to him, everything that in your marriage, you could take everything you own into the Ark also. Okay.